Hello, good afternoon, everyone. We're excited to have you all join us today. Um, my name is Vicki Bowden. I am the project manager here in HOP, um, where I work with several of our education programs. We are so excited to kick off our second annual summer research seminar series, where we'll, we'll be inviting many of our researchers here at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center to share their work, as well as engage with um, our attendees. We're really excited to have you all join us um, today. Before we begin and Dr. Sethna speaks, I did want to share um, a couple couple of housekeeping items with you all. So the format will be, um, I will do an introduction just to go through the overview of today. Then um, Dr. Sethna will speak. Afterwards, we'll have a Q&A um, portion. I'll explain how the Q&A works and then we will have um, closing remarks. So a couple of reminders, this is a Zoom webinar. It's not a regular Zoom meeting, so you will not be able as attendees to um, turn on your camera or um, your unmute yourselves. But to engage with our speakers, we'll be using the Q&A um, format. How that will work, you will submit a question via Q&A and towards the end, myself and other facilitators will be able to read your question live and Dr. Sethna will ask, answer them. And then lastly, at the end of today's webinar, you will get a feedback survey. We ask that um, you complete that as this will be how um, us as facilitators will engage with students and attendees overall to make certain that um, if there are any concerns or ways we can improve the survey and your feedback is truly valuable for us. And recordings for those that would like to review recordings after um, today's live webinar, they will be posted um, later this week on our YouTube page. You can visit the HOP Summer Student Program on YouTube and the videos will be posted there. And our upcoming schedule, just a reminder, we will have webinars every Wednesday um, at 1 p.m. And it's the same registration link you used for this one. You should have gotten all of your um, webinar information to join for in the coming weeks. And let's continue to stay connected. We have a Twitter page. This is where we will be posting any updates regarding um, our program, the seminar series. So we encourage you all to attend as well. So um, now for introductions, um, we have the great pleasure of having Dr. Zachary Sethna from the v Vinod Balachandran lab speaking today. His talk is entitled Modeling T-Cell Rep Repertories and Recognition. So before um, Dr. Sethna joins us, I did want to share a brief bio about him. So he's a research scholar in the Balachandran lab where he studies the interaction of T-cell repertories and cancer. His work is geared towards developing hybrid experimental and comp computational approaches for identifying and characterizing specific T-cell cell responses and immune pressures on tumor growth. Dr. Sethna's interests span from theoretical descriptions of immune repertories to direct clinical applications where he is involved in the clinical trial for personalized cancer vaccines. Before joining the Balachandran lab here at MSK in December of 2018, um, Dr. Sethna received his PhD in physics from Princeton University, where he developed probabilistic models and computational tools to analyze T and B cell repertories. Again, we'd like to welcome Dr. Sethna and thank you so much for speaking with us today. So I'll just stop sharing my screen and you could take it away. Uh, thanks so much for that uh, introduction. Here, let me just share my screen. Okay. Oops. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. So, oops. Sorry, one moment. Okay. All right. So, I just wanted to. to uh, thank you all so much for that kind of introduction. Thank you all for being here. 
Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, T cell repertoires and how um, they might interact and control cancer. Um, but I hope I'll do this in a way that you may not have seen before. Um, and in particular, my goal here is not just to describe the science, um, but tr to try to give you a flavor of how some quantitative um, modeling works and even theoretical ideas, even if it's rather um, abstract and cartoonish. So to start, I kind of wanted to explain um, who I am or really what I am um, and how I ended up here at MSK. This is not because my particular story is all that interesting, um, but because it illustrates um, an important uh, trend that I think you can all um, possibly take advantage of if you're aware of it. Um, so unlike some of the presenters you're, you're going to see, um, my background isn't in medicine, it's not in immunology or oncology, um, but it's rather physics, not only physics, but theory. Um, you know, so I'm not in the lab, I don't uh, use pipettes. Um, all I do is pencil and paper or with a computer. Um, and the, the type of physics I specialize in, though, isn't what you might assume. I don't deal with pulleys. I don't deal with black holes or high energy particles. Instead, I'm a statistical physicist. Um, this is a branch of physics you may not have uh, interacted with um, or been exposed to. Um, and really what I the, the bulk of what I do is I deal with probability distributions, I deal with information theory, and I deal with effective models. So what do we mean by this? Well, you know, physicists often get a lot of flack for kind of looking down on other branches. Um, you know, there's some justification here. Um, and I think this, this comic does a great job of, of uh, capturing this dynamic, which is, you know, the physicists think that everything reduces down to physics, and you know you could you could argue that, um, but the physicists think that they have all these phenomenal models and look down on how messy things are elsewhere. Um, and this is true, but the reason why this is is because the quantitative data that you get gets much better as you go this way. In some sense, physicists are spoiled, right? You know they get to deal with phenomena that have really precise quantitative data, whereas um, other disciplines don't have access to that uh, quality of data. However, this is quickly changing, and this is this is a big opportunity for for people to to jump in. So, for instance, the the cost of sequencing uh, DNA or RNA has dropped uh, exponentially in recent years, which means that the amount of data has increased exponentially, and this is high quality quantitative data. So you can, I mean, we can now do experiments where you can sequence all the mRNA of a single cell. You can do this for thousands of cells in a, in a single experiment, uh, giving a snapshot of the entire exome of a, of a, of a cell. Um, and this explosion of data um, is a huge opportunity to construct quantitative models uh, or even theoretical models of biological systems. Um, and fortunately for me, you know, my background is how do I take that kind of data and construct effective models from this, from, from this data? Um, however, you know, you don't need a PhD in physics to do this. Um, you know, if you just learn a little bit of math and a little bit of programming, you could easily replace me. And to that end, I've got a little bit of advice. Um, first, don't be afraid of learning a little bit of math. Nothing really annoys me more than when someone says they're a non-math person. Okay, there's no such thing. Any of you can learn as much math as I know. You just have to be willing to put in the work. And I'll also uh, repeat some advice that I'm sure you've heard a gazillion times, which is uh, learn a bit of programming. You don't have to take a programming course. You can learn it on your own. I learned program how to program on my own. But the number of analyses you do really opens up immensely if you can code it up yourself. If you can plot by yourself, if you can analyze data yourself, then you don't have to rely on someone like me to do these analyses. Um, and I do want to, though, give some uh, advice that I don't see so commonly, which is you should get familiar with probabilistic approaches and statistical inference. And in particular, I think that information theory is a great way of approaching this. If you can get comfortable with some um, information theoretic ideas like entropy and mutual information and see how they can connect to a larger abstract idea, 
you can go very, very far without anything complicated. Um, the, the math there is really quite straightforward. And lastly, this is more of a, of a you know, approach, which is I think you shouldn't let your ego get in the way. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be afraid to ask the stupid questions. You know, many days I think the real advantage of being a physicist in a biology lab is that I don't know anything. And so I don't get embarrassed if I ask a stupid question. But frequently those questions get to the core problem faster than you might expect. And, you know, then you don't lose sight of the big picture. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to, uh, to email me at, at, uh, Seth, at this email address. Okay. Um, so I think this is a great motto to encapsulate what I'm going to be, the approach I'm ta talking today about and for you moving forward, which is all models are wrong, but some are useful. And I think too many people focus on the models are wrong part and less on the how useful are they? I think the criticism of a model really ought to be that it's not useful and not whether it's right or wrong. Um, a lot of times when people are constructing scientific theories, they worry about all the details um, and you never get all the details right. But sometimes you can say something interesting, even if you are looking at from a bird's eye view at a very cartoonish view at a very cartoonish view of the, of, the, of the science, which of course is what we physicists are notorious for, right? Cows are obviously not spherical. The running joke is you ask a physicist a problem and they'll give you an answer about a spherical cow. But sometimes you actually can learn things from uh, a spherical cow model. You know, for instance, if the relevant thing is some kind of surface, to, uh, surface area to volume ratio, you know, examples could be if it's thermal regulation or circulatory requirements and things of this sort, even a spherical cow model can tell you something about how big an animal can be, you know, how, you know, how much circulation you need and things of this sort. So in the talk today, I'm going to be talking about, you know, T cells, uh, T cell repertoires, how it can interact with cancer, but we're going to be doing a spherical cow approach pretty much the whole way through. And it'll be up to you to decide if, if you think that we actually are learning something useful from this uh, bird's eye view approach. So the outline is gonna be, we're gonna have a very cartoonish introduction to the adaptive immune system. And then we'll try to, to talk about a, a, a nice little story about just how diverse uh, the repertoire of T cells are and how that, you know, some interesting observations about that. And then I'd like to hopefully end with a discussion about how we can kind of take these lessons and um, how we can take these lessons and uh, learn about um, possible application to cancer and cancer antigens. So the, the, the big questions that I think you ought to keep your eye on to help you guide through this uh, presentation is going to be, why do we need an adaptive immune system? How does the immune system differentiate foreign peptides from self? And uh, why does this aspect make it hard uh, for, the, for the adaptive immune system to control cancer? And then maybe at the end, how can we help the adaptive immune system fight cancer. Okay, so as a very cartoonish view, the immune system has a very important role, which is to make sure that foreign uh, pathogens, foreign parasites, cancer cells don't adversely affect you. And before the immune system can um, remove or eliminate any of these foreign uh, pathogens or, or bad things in general, it needs to first identify, okay? And this is going to be the thing that we are going to focus on today is really just the identification process. We're going to kind of ignore all of the downstream um, complexities of how the immune system can uh, remove and, and take care of you know, viruses or parasites and things of this sort. Instead, just focus on how can the immune system identify foreign things while also being making sure it doesn't attack the self? So this ends up being a um, 
discrimination problem where we're going to try to differentiate between self and foreign. And so a term that I'm going to keep coming back to here is going to be, um, and I'll, I'll be a little bit sloppy with this, but I'm going to refer to this as either an epitope or an antigen. And what I'm talking about here is often a little, little peptide fragment or a little shape or something like this. And this is a little object that the immune system could identify. And so I, I try to schematically show that in this, in this figure with these little uh, cartoonish shapes that are either on the virus, the bacteria, or on the self. And so the goal is going to be to try to differentiate self epitopes from foreign epitopes. Okay. And this can be quite a, a challenging thing because the number of self epitopes is reasonably small. It's, you know, if we think of the full exome of the human genome, it's on the order of 10 to the seven amino acids. So, you know, the number of self uh, epitopes is probably going to be on the order of 10 to the seven. But the number of foreign epitopes can be absolutely enormous. We'll, we'll, we'll give uh, some estimates uh, a little bit later on, um, but many of these things may, you know, may never have been seen before. It's not, it's not like the, the human um, immune system can have looked at the full history of, of, of human evolution and know what it needs to see. Sometimes you get things like a novel coronavirus that has never existed before. And so you need to be able to, sh to, be able to identify anything that comes your way. So this is hard. You need to be able to identify any foreign antigen but you also want to remember the things you've seen before. You got to not, uh, you know, you need to be able to ignore self peptides. Otherwise the immune system could attack the self and then you'll have an autoimmune response. And you got to do all of this with a pretty limited number of immune cells. When I say limited, I really mean finite. We'll see it's a huge number, but it's not an unlimited number. So, I do feel a little bit obligated to just give you the broad strokes of the adaptive immune system in terms of cell types, even though we won't go into depth here. Um, in general, the adaptive immune system is broken down into two main types of cells, B cells and T cells. The B cells are ones that you might be more familiar with. They bind antigens in their natural state. Um, so, you know, proteins that are free floating in plasma or, um, uh, membrane proteins, things of this sort. Um, and they're the ones that produce antibodies, right? And this is one of the standard pictures you might learn that the antibodies you know, will tag things either for later uh, immune cell um, destruction, you know, tags it for immune cells to destroy it, or it can actually just muck up you know, a virus or a bacteria just by covering it. Um, however, what we're gonna focus on today actually are cytotoxic T cells. And these are cells that monitor antigens that are produced inside the cell. So in particular, what they'll do is um, they monitor to make sure that cells aren't producing any foreign proteins as a matter of course. This is important because you can have you know, viruses which could infect a cell. And then if they start producing, so if a cell starts producing viral proteins, you wanna be able to identify it and eliminate that cell so that you know, the virus doesn't uh, multiply and, and, and spread. Um, so I think a good way of thinking about cytotoxic T cells is that it's a little bit like uh, factory quality control. So if you have a bunch of uh, T cells here, or sorry, not T cells, these are just normal cells and they're producing a bunch of proteins. What happens is for pretty much all uh, somatic cells, they're going to, um, uh, express this, this particular type of protein called an MHC protein, MHC class one. And what this does is it presents little uh, fragments, little chopped up pieces of all the proteins that the cell is producing at any given time. And it, and it presents this to make sure that uh, T cells can, can monitor this and see if there are any of these epitopes which aren't self, don't belong there. And the way the T cell does this is it has a very specific receptor 
which will bind to this uh, P, uh, peptide MHC complex, this uh, uh, MHC uh, molecule with a loaded up uh, epitope or peptide. And if it specifically binds here, as we can see this, this yellow guy here, um, then it can uh, uh, destroy the cell, right? It's identified it as, as uh, producing a foreign, foreign protein and it will eliminate it. And so where do these, uh, or so these T cells each will only be expressing a single receptor. So a good way of like viewing this as a, as a cartoon then is that if we're going to be talking about the adaptive immune system, we can kind of break it apart into three components. We have the list of epitopes that we're going to want to identify. We're going to have a bunch of T cell receptors or T cell clones that are going that we are going to curate. And then there's going to be some matching function, right? That tells me if a particular receptor matches a particular epitope. Okay. And the goal is, is by producing these guys that we'll be able to identify all of these. And if we want to make sure we don't attack the self, well, what can we do? We can eliminate all the receptors here that bind self peptides. So this is a, a, a pretty convenient way for the immune system or for your, for your body to be able to, to do this. The problem of course is how do we make sure that we cover all possible epitopes so that we can identify any foreign uh, virus or, or bacteria or cancer? We'll return to cancer later. Um, so a good uh, cartoon visualization of this is let's say that we're trying to cover this square space right here. Well, you can imagine I could just start throwing down um, you know, red circles randomly here, right? In some sense, this is what the immune system does. It randomly is going to generate receptors. We'll talk about how that happens in a moment. And it tries to cover this space, but you need a lot of them to be able to cover this because we need to make sure there aren't any gaps because if there are gaps, then a virus could be not self-contained. But what about those self-peptides we talked about before? Well, if we imagine we've got a few of the self-peptides, these blue dots spread out randomly in the space, well, then we could identify which T cell clones are identifying these, uh, these self-peptides, so these blue clones, and we can remove them or silence them in some fashion, control it such that you don't have an autoimmune response. And then our effective coverage of this uh, immune space is going to be, um, you know, we're going to be punching holes around all of these self-peptides, as you can see here. And this process is called negative selection. And in fact, the immune system, a whole lot of the immune system is a very complicated mechanism of enforcing negative selection because runaway immune responses can be quite deadly to the individual. This is why autoimmune diseases are, are so problematic. Um, there's another thing I want to highlight here, which is that there's a trade-off here between um, how big these uh, circles are, and by extension, how many of these circles I need to cover the space, and how big these gaps are, right? If I had a lot, a, a few number of big circles, I could cover the space, but then if I start weeding them out, because of negative selection, I'm gonna leave giant gaps. If I use really small circles, I'm gonna need a lot more of them to cover the space. So we kind of know already that we're gonna need a lot of receptors in order to identify any possible um, viral epitope while still uh, not having uh, negative, you know, uh, autoimmune responses. So, how many T cells do we have to play with here, right? How many circles can I use to cover the space? Well, the, the estimates are roughly around 10 to the eight or 10 to the nine unique T cell receptors in an individual uh, repertoire, so in, in your body. Um, and when I say repertoire here, I mean the collection of all receptors 
that are going to be uh, found in your blood. How does that compare to the number of epitopes that we might want to recognize? Well, we said earlier that they are going to, for, for cytotoxic T cells, the things, the peptides that can be loaded up into these MHC molecules tend to be eight to 11 amino acids long, right? So if you do the math of 20 different amino acids, that is on the order, uh, you know, it's more than 10 to the 14 possible ones. So you know already each of these receptors had better identify quite a few of these uh, possible peptides. Even if not all of them are actually able to be presented, but that's a, that's a detail for another time. Um, but we also run into another problem here, which is this number of unique T cell receptors is enormous, especially when we compare it to the full exome of, of your genetic code. So you've got a finite amount of DNA, right? I told, I told you it was on the order of 10 to the seven different amino acids. That's way smaller than the number of unique T cell receptors that you have in your uh, T cell repertoire. And this is an in interesting informational question. How can this happen? Because each of these receptors is a protein. You need a unique uh, DNA sequence to code for it. So it turns out that what happens is for T cells, and B cells, um, there's a process called VDJ recombination that occurs that actually recombines the DNA in these particular cells. So when I talk about a T cell clone, which is going to have an individual receptor, it actually has a unique DNA sequence that we could actually sequence. So just very quickly, um, the way the VDJ recombination works is you've got a bunch of different little cassettes and what happens is you go through and you systematically splice and insert some, some untemplated uh, nucleotides into the process. Um, and the, the important thing is that you end up with this uh, DNA sequence down here that we can identify different parts. Um, there's a V part, there's a D part, there's a J part, this is where the name comes from. And at the junction, the splicing junctions, we insert uh, random uh, nucleotides. Um, and I wanna highlight this for a moment because this is a good example of where we can construct in, a nice quantitative model to gain some insight. So the, because of uh, you know, new sequencing techniques, you can actually sequence, take a draw of blood and sequence millions of T cells at once and get lists of this uh, CDR3 junction. This is this little locus of uh, DNA that, that we're showing here. Um, and you can get easily a million sequences from one sample and you know, hundreds of thousands of unique sequences. And we can use this actually to construct a probabilistic model for the rules of how these sequences get generated. So, I'm gonna zip through this quite quickly. Um, just, I just wanted to give you a sense of what a probabilistic model like this might look like. And then we can see kind of uh, a quick application of it. So all, all we are gonna do here is, as I said, we can identify these different parts of the uh, DNA sequence. And if we can just identify them, we can treat them as hidden variables. And we can then just say, there's a gene choice, deletions from each of the gene choices. And there are our random insertions. And if we just assign probabilities to each of these components, we can assign a probability to the whole sequence. Okay. Now, all of these things are hidden. It turns out that if we look at a particular DNA sequence, they're actually, you know, there, this could be a way of assigning those different parts, but there actually could be a bunch of different ways of assigning uh, the different components, the gene choices versus the insertions. And so the total probability of a sequence is actually gonna be the sum of all the different ways of possibly generating that sequence. Now, there's a, a, a great way of inferring uh, a model with hidden variables like this. It's called expectation maximization. I won't go into the details of this, uh, suffice it to say that you can, you can infer a model that you actually infer all of the different components of that probability distribution 
by using large data sets of you know, 10,000 sequences of, of uh, just a random blood draw from, from a baseline human. And what we can do with that then is that we can plot and see how diverse this probability distribution that generates these receptors is. So I'm using a, a bio a information theoretic um, quantity here, entropy, to assess the diversity. Uh, a good way of thinking about this is that um, sort of the effective number of uh, possible um, receptors or sequences is going to be two raised to the number of bits this is. Okay, this is if they were all equally likely. However, we see that the receptors are not equally likely. And in particular, some receptors are, can be quite likely, have generative probabilities of greater than you know, 10 to the seven or 10 to the minus seven or something like this. You're almost guaranteed to have that receptor in you, whereas some are extremely rare. And so those receptors will be unique to you as an individual and will probably never be generated in any other human ever. So, yeah. And furthermore, these rules actually are quite consistent from human to human. Um, whereas your individual repertoire it can, is entirely unique and is a history of the different pathogens that you've been exposed to, the rules of the games, the rules of generating these receptors is, are actually remarkably consistent across humans. So what can we learn from this uh, diversity? Well, the, the, just straight up, the, the number of possible receptors is absolutely enormous, okay, right? We're talking 10 to the eight different, or 10 to the 18 possible receptors. Um, of those, you're only sampling 10 to the eight, 10 to the nine. So we see not only is it the case that each receptor had better identify a bunch of different epitopes, but each epitope is going to have a lot of different possible receptors that can identify it. So there's a lot of redundancy here, which is important if we wanted to be sure that we have that good coverage that we saw before in our, in our schematic. Now, there are other, a couple of other nice little observations I want to make here. Um, uh, this incredible diversity means that uh, if we sequence the, the T cells of, of an individual, you can actually identify that individual. And you can actually even differentiate uh, identical twins this way, whereas you would not be able to do that if you just sequence their DNA. Um, it is also the case, as we've noted, that some uh, receptors are very likely to be generated. And so if we see those uh, sequences um, responding in a particular way multiple times, um, you might think that the, these particular receptors, there's something interesting about them. They might be uh, you know, special, they might have extra uses and evolution might have uh, preferentially designed these receptors to be more useful than others. And it does seem to be the case uh, for those of you who are um, more well acquainted with uh, the details of the immune system, that things like NK, T cells and mate cells are actually have much more likely receptors than you'd see for uh, the general T cell receptor. Okay, so I wanna move on to the last part now quickly, um, which is cancer in the immune system. So, a big, a big component of cancer is that you acquire different mutations, right? And if you acquire mutations, what does this mean? Well, there's amino acid substitution. So suddenly a self protein is going to become a foreign protein in some capacity. They might be very similar, but they are different in some capacity. And the different function of the uh, protein, this might make the cell cancerous or might just be an observer but cancer cells will acquire these mutations and possibly the T cells might be able to differentiate between these self and foreign proteins and target these cancer cells for uh, destruction. So there does seem to be some evidence for this. And in fact, this is the appeal of immunotherapy in general. 
Um, so we can see that if we look at different cancers and we look at how many mutations they tend to have, um, that tends to be correlated with um, response to immunotherapy treatment. In this case, it is uh, PDL1 or anti PDL1 um, treatment. Um, so it does seem to be that the more mutations you have, the more immune targets you might have. And so when I'm gonna talk about immune targets here, I'm, I'm gonna use the term new antigen, okay? And when I say new antigen, this is going to be a new antigen or a new epitope that arises as a result of one of these mutations. So when do we think they might be immunogenic? So I'm gonna refer back to our uh, cartoon here of uh, negative selection, right? So if the blue dots are the um, uh, self-peptides and we've removed all the T-cell clones which are reactive to the self-peptides, um, that leaves these gaps. So let's zoom in on one of these gaps, okay? So here we've got our self-peptide, it's sitting in this gap. And now what happens if there's a mutation to it, right? Well, maybe the mutation doesn't take me very far and I'm still sitting in this gap where there are no T cells that, res that, that respond to me. But if I move very far away, right? Over into this corner, we see it's very red and maybe um, this uh, could be a, a potentially very immunogenic uh, antigen that could stimulate a strong immune response and possibly allow the immune system to help control this cancer that has this uh, mutation. So we want to model this, right? And I want to highlight that the key thing about this distance in this space is whether or not these two dots are kind of able to be drawn within the same circle. And what does that mean? Well, that means that the same T cell can recognize both of them, or we can say that it is cross-reactive to both of them. So we would like to construct a model for this cross-reactivity and when two peptides might be cross-reactive to the same T cell. So one of the great things about being at a place like MSK is that there are great uh, experimental opportunities with uh, people with great expertise. So we uh, designed this particular experiment where what we're going to do is we are going to um, uh, measure the reactivity of a monoclonal T cell uh, population. So one T cell clone with one uh, T cell receptor and see how it responds as a function of epitope concentration, um, both for a pseudo self protein, so a, uh, a wild type protein, and a bunch of uh, peptides or epitopes, which are one amino acid substitution away. So this is mimicking a cancer mutation. And the question is, does, do these reactivity curves shift a little bit? In which case, maybe that T cell recognizes this other antigen as well, or does it shift a lot? In which case the reactivity is lost. So this experimental setup, um, which is done, uh, this is largely done by, by uh, my collaborator, Louise Rojas, um, in, in conjunction with uh, Anton Dobrin from the, from the Sadelin lab. And what they do is they actually transfect uh, the sequence of a T cell uh, receptor. So they transfect the TCR into donor T cells. So this is to make sure that all of these T cells have this particular receptor. And then we uh, co-culture them with uh, um, cells which are presenting uh, the, the, the different peptides that we want to screen, the different epitopes we want to screen. So we, we co-culture them and then we measure how many of these, what fraction of these T cells are activated. And to do this, we use three different TCRs that are specific to a, uh, this is technically a viral peptide epitope, a CMV peptide. But this picture, as we were saying, is, is, is cartoonish and is, is in broad strokes. So we hope that the, that the lessons we learned here could apply to this scenario of cancer.
And so we see they do look like these hill functions that I was showing before, these sigmoids. And so what we're going to do is we're going to check all different peptides that are one amino acid away from the wild type peptide. And we're gonna see which ones of them um, are still uh, reactive to these three TCRs that we know are reactive to the wild type and which ones aren't. And I just wanna really highlight just how much work this is, right? This is 171 different uh, peptides. There's three different TCRs. We have to check all of them. And to do each experiment, we have to measure multiple concentration points. So this is a huge amount of work, which I am lucky enough to not have done. And this is why I'm so thankful to my experimental collaborators for doing this. But we can see that there is a wide range of different behaviors, even from a single amino acid substitution. Sometimes, so the black here is the wild type. So that's when it's left alone. So particularly in these middle positions, pretty much any substitution you make will completely destroy all the reactivity. But some uh, mutations are highly preserved. So the question is, can we construct a model for this? So to do that, we first need to extract those distances that I was showing before, right? And to do that, we just fit a, a hill function to each of these curves, and we're going to extract this 50% mark, the CC50, um, from each of these curves. And this is going to give us this heat map. And so just to explain it quickly, we have our wild type peptide here. On the y-axis, we have um, uh, which amino acid we substitute for each one in each position. The red uh, square indicates where uh, the wild type peptide is. And we can see that the wild type peptide is always very reactive, so it's very yellow, whereas some positions you lose a lot. And I've actually rearranged these amino acids to highlight the, the, the structure that emerges from this. And we can see it even more clearly here. It does seem, so this now is labeling um, how many of those three different TCRs were highly reactive to each of these mutants. And we can see they seem to cluster decently well. Um, I'll point out though, this is not perfect. As we said before, at the very beginning, all models are wrong, but some are useful. So we should ask ourselves, are we gonna learn anything useful out of this? So to model this, what we do is we're gonna write down the simplest model we can because we're working in a pretty low data limit. And so again, we've extracted these distances this we're gonna call it log C here. It's gonna be our distance between these different curves. And to model it, we're going to just write down, we're gonna say that it's gonna depend on position and we're gonna have an amino acid substitution matrix, which is to say, when we substitute one amino acid for another, how far apart do we think they are? So which amino acids are more similar to each other? And we make a further approximation that we can represent it in this with this 2D projection um, because we're still in a pretty low data limit and we need to make a bunch of different um, uh, approximations in order to extract anything useful. And so we can see that this models our data somewhat well. It's not amazing, it's not great, but there does seem to be some signal. And again, the model is wrong, but the question is, is it useful? So can we use this um, understanding and see if we actually see immune pressures in actual tumors as a result of this potential immunogenicity, this distance from self? And so we actually think we, we do see that, but to do that, we actually need real cancer data. And this is one of the great things about being at MSK is that um, there, there are wonderful data sets um, that are available as a result of the research that is done here. So in particular, um, I've worked with this um, pancreas cancer cohort. Um, pancreas cancer is actually a great um, uh, model system for us to look for this immune pressure. And I'll explain why. So it's extremely deadly. And it's a model cold cancer, which is to say that it's generally thought of as not having much of an immune response. This is why it's highly resistant to immunotherapies. Less than 5% response rate, this is extremely deadly. However, 
at MSK, MSK is a phenomenal hospital. They've done some great resections. And some of these patients, this, the 9% actually survive for quite a long time. And it turns out that the ones who survive for quite a long time actually have much more of an immune response than the short-term uh, survivors that have the characteristic progression of an extremely deadly um, cancer. And so we think that we can use this by saying that it, the long-term survivors should have more immune uh, pressure than the short-term survivors. And so what does that mean? Well, if we're talking about an immune pressure, this is a evolutionary selective pressure. And so we might see characteristic things like depletion of new antigens, or in particular, if we think that this self non-self aspect is important, and we think it makes a new antigen more immunogenic, we would want to see that the less self new antigens and mutations have been preferentially depleted. And so to do this, we have our, our, a long-term longitudinal cohort. Um, the the long-term survivors have a median survival of over five years. Short-term survivors, um, uh, tragically uh, pass away much sooner than that. Um, and we have a, a decent number of, of samples. And for each sample, we sequence uh, not only primary tumors, but recurrent tumors. So you can actually track the evolutionary progression of these tumors in time. And so, yes, yeah, so as I said here, um, the, the, the median survival of the, of the long-term survivors is, is over five years whereas for the short-term survivors is around two years. And so we have our different cohorts. We have all of the tumors sequenced, which is to say we get the full exome with all of the mutations labeled for these tumors. Now, are, uh, do we see any signal? Is anything preferentially depleted? Well, if we look at, if you remember our model, we had this substitution matrix. So we assign whether or not different uh, amino acid substitutions are more or less self-like. And so if we look at that, we can see that the mutations which are less self-like, so further from self, do seem to be preferentially depleted, particularly in the long-term survivors, as opposed to the short-term survivors. Now, the important thing actually is not whether or not um, they're depleted overall like this, because we haven't uh, imposed a null model here, but comparatively are they. So if we compare the two cohorts, we can look at the relative frequencies of each amino acid substitution, and we can see it negatively correlates with our substitution matrix M. Okay? And furthermore, if we look at the actual new antigens, so what we think is being presented, and we look at this uh, distance from self, we can see, if we look at the cumulative probability distribution, that it is massively depleted in the long-term survivors compared to the short-term survivors. So there, we think that there is a selective pressure or a greater selective pressure in the long-term survivors to be closer to self than in the short-term survivors. And we think that this is linked to the immunogenicity of these uh, new antigens. So in summary, you know, is this useful? Well, we think that by characterizing um, which epitopes might be most immunogenic, it can motivate how you might select things, for instance, for a personalized mRNA vaccine. And in fact, um, this is what we're, what we're doing. We're part of a clinical trial right now um, where you select a bunch of different new antigens based off of sequencing uh, individual person's tumor. And you actually use the same mRNA platform that, uh, that has gotten so much attention now from the COVID vaccine. Um, although this is, uh, these uh, personalized cancer vaccines have been in the work for, for quite a bit longer. So I'm actually involved in um, assessing one of these uh, clinical trials for our personalized um, mRNA vaccines. And we hope that the outcomes of this can help refine um, the selection of which mutations we should care about most um, for, for, this, for this vaccine uh, construction. And with that, I want to you know, thank all of you for listening and all of my many, many collaborators. 
um, who have participated uh, immensely to this work. Um, and with that, I, I, I'll, I'll take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Snetha. Um, so if you don't mind turning on your video and then we'll go ahead and start our Q&A. So the first question um, that we received was from Murat. They asked, don't cancer, I believe aren't cancer cells just mutated he human cells? So they want to- uh, Absolutely, yes, that's, that's the point. And that's why it's hard to, um, identify and for the immune system to identify and target uh, cancer cells because um, they are, uh, you know, they're, they're just uh, one or two mutations away. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Dr. Sentha. The next question goes to Bhavia Kapoor. What is a repertoire? Uh, uh, so the repertoire is the collection of all of the different receptors for T cells and B cells. So, you know, in, you know, it's repertoire, even in the, 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 the lay sense, right? You talk about a collection of things that, that, that you can do or that you have, um, you know, your repertoire of music or something like this. So your repertoire is the collection of T cell receptors or B cell receptors that you have in your body. Great question. Thanks so much, Dr. Snetha. The next question goes to, um, they ask, why don't we just train the immune system to become very familiar with self epitopes and attacking everything else? So that's the goal. The question is, how do you do that? The problem is, is that you can't just record um, all the epitopes that you might want to attack. You don't even know what they are in advance. And a lot of them are very close to self. So you need a, a, a dynamic system that doesn't know in advance what is self and what is not self, but figures it out. Because otherwise there's no way to, to properly regulate it to not attack self or to not miss anything. Because if you had just preset rules, then uh, you know, pathogens could find chinks in the armor. Now I will say, that there's a whole nother aspect to the immune system called the innate immune system, which does target things which are very different from self. So um, you're absolutely right that there are ways of identifying large swaths of uh, different pathogens and parasites that are really different from humans and um, you know that are easy to identify. So you, you have kind of a different part of the immune system that deals with those. And what the adaptive immune system is concerned in is that the hard part is trying to identify things which are close to self, but not self. Okay, great, thank you so much. The next question is from Anika. She asks, can more than one antigen get attached to the receptor? Um, not at once. Um, right, these are two proteins that are, are, are going to be binding pretty specifically. However, as I was mentioning before, it is absolutely the case that you can have multiple, that one receptor can um, bind to multiple antigens. In fact, that's what the, the, the whole um, cross-reactivity story I was talking about is based upon. In fact, this is necessary. You don't have enough receptors in your body to identify all possible epitopes. So you absolutely have to require that they can identify multiple different antigens. The great question. question is, what is the difference between the peptides and epitopes? Sorry, I was a little sloppy. They, they are pretty much the same. <laughs> epitopes are generally thought of as um, small pieces of a larger protein or peptide. And they're the part that the receptor is going to bind to or identify. So it's, it's a piece of the whole. Um, when you say peptide, you're really talking about either a full protein or you're talking about a protein fragment. It largely means an amino acid sequence. So I was a little sloppy in this terminology, but the epitope is really the, the, the specific part that the, the receptor is going to recognize. Great, thank you. Amanda's question is, how does the innate immune system work with the adaptive immune system? So they largely, um, I mean, immune system is incredibly complicated. <laughs> um, but in broad strokes, as I say, it's this kind of divide and conquer approach. The innate immune system is going to 
um, attack things which are very obviously not self. So, you know, if you have a very, you know, if you get a cut and you get a lot of bacteria in there, um, there's certain aspects of those bacteria that could be really easy to identify and the innate immune system can be called in to go deal with that. Whereas the adaptive immune system is going to be dealing with um, things which are much closer to self, um, things that might be within an individual cell, you know, for instance, uh, a viral infection where you, you've incorporated the virus and you have infected cells that you have to clear. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's a precision tool as opposed to a, a broader, you know, attack strategy. Um, and there are, you know, pluses and minuses to both approaches and you kind of need both because you need both the quick, uh, you know, quickly dealing with, um, you know, an infection as well as being able to develop long-term um, uh, specific tools to deal with chronic infections and things of this sort. Thank you. Dominique asks, can you talk about the similarities and differences between VDJ recombination and CRISPR? Oh, now that is a very, very, very good question. Um, so CRISPR um, is a similar immune um, system technique, actually, in the sense that that's kind of how bacteria um, you know, that's their immune system. So what they do is that they uh, incorporate different um, viral, you know, um, sequences. And then they know if I see that particular, you know, uh, sequence to, 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 to deal with it. Um, so it's active uptake of a target. Now, this can work for bacteria because bacteria have lots of generations and um, have, a, have a whole spread. So in fact, you can write down a very nice, uh, I have a, have a friend who's written down this, has a great paper about comparing sort of the generation time between um, an individual and then sort of the pathogens it gets exposed to. And you can um, just by writing down simple optimization stuff, um, identify different optimal strategies. One of which could be um, an adaptive immune system, which is going to be VDJ recombination, which is going to be generating arbitrary receptors that you might not know what you're gonna see, right? We don't know what we're going to see over the course of our lifetime because pathogens evolve so much faster than we do. So you might see multiple different flu strains over the course of your life, and you can't just uptake one and just remember the only that one. You need to be able to, you should remember it, but you also need to be able to identify new things as well. Whereas what CRISPR does is because the um, generation time of a bacteria is so much closer to that of a virus, for instance, it can get away with actively uptaking and saying, this is what I need to look out for, and then forgetting things from a little bit earlier on. So the reason why we have an adaptive immune system is we need to remember what, to, what we've seen while also finding new things, whereas bacteria are okay with doing a little bit of forgetting. Okay, great, thank you so much. And our last question, um, we'll go to Steven Te. He asks, are personalized vaccines a common practice now? I wouldn't say it's a common practice. Uh, you know, nothing is um, FDA approved or anything like this, but it is a growing uh, field of research. Um, you know, it's, it's very intriguing because there are a bunch of, there are some cancers which respond really well to immunotherapy and there are others that don't. And immunotherapy has been one of the, you know, great, um, cancer treatments. And if there's, if there's a way of, of allowing, um, you know, um, stereotypically cold tumors, which do not respond to immunotherapy, if there's a way of juicing the immune system to be able to work in those contexts, that's very intriguing. So there's a lot of active research into designing these personalized vaccines. And there's, there's some hope that there, that there might be actual efficacy, but we need to wait for the, for the clinical trials to, to go through before we can really say. Great. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Sethna. We are at the hour. For those that didn't have their questions answered, we will share um, Dr. Sethna's 
email, feel free to email him with any questions that you have regarding um, today's talk. I did want to share some final announcements and reminders before we close for the day. Hold on, let me just put this in full screen. I hope you all can see here. So our next seminar will be next week, um, Wednesday with Dr. Faye and Foley Bolligan. And um, as a reminder, all of the recordings will be posted on our YouTube page. We will notify all seminar registrants um, for when those will be available for viewing. Again, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today um, for our talk with Dr. Setna and all will be well and we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you again, Dr. Setna. Bye everyone.